Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship today. It's good to be with you. I wasn't expecting to be here this morning. I thought we were going to be out of town visiting my folks, but uh, Paulette was lucky enough to catch the uh, sinus bug that's going around that all the other kids had, so we are here. But I get the great uh, privilege of listening to somebody else preach today. So Kelly's our guest preacher today, and I'm looking forward to that. In just a moment, we're going to have our special music from the uh, praise team. And uh, I got to listen to them warm up this morning, and we've heard it one other time, but it's so good. And I think I might even have some of the dance and song moves uh, memorized, so I might just make a cameo appearance. No, just joking. All right. (laughs) Tomorrow night, we have our core uh, leadership team meeting. Wednesday night, we have the garden. All other announcements are listed in the bulletin as well. And we give thanks for this day, and we're glad that you're here. Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. And now I invite you to listen to this special music, Grace Got You. Have you ever met those who keep humming when the song's through? It's like they're living life to a whole different tune. And have you ever met those that keep hoping when it's hopeless? It's like they figured out what the rest haven't yet. Second you realize what you have inside. So when you're standing in the rain again, you might as well be dancing. Why? Cause there ain't no storm that can change how this ends. So next time you feel blue, let the spot leave you. Why? Cause you have every reason just to sing. So the back row hears you cry. So walk and just want to dance. You don't have to know how to. Warm it up, let it go. Shout it out, celebrate. When you can't articulate, just say amazing grace. Oh, that's such a great song. Thank you. All right. I invite you to stand now 
as Mitzi leads us in our call to worship and we begin singing our opening songs. I feel all revved up, ready to go. Yeah, Grace got you. All right, Mitzi, take it away. Our hope, our help is in the name of the Lord, our God. Maker of heaven and earth. Who comes to our aid in times of need. who invites us to turn away from the influences of the world around us. And following Christ's way of love and compassion. Let us praise and worship God. Amen. All right, now it is your turn. Please sing with us verses 1, 2, and 4 of A Mighty Fortress is Our God, hymn 65, if you are in your hymn mode. We're going to bring Voices for Him up here for our per first uh, praise song. We realized when we got together and we're practicing this morning, we're like, we kind of look like a rainbow today in honor of pride. We didn't really intend it, but, you know, it looks good anyway. I like it. Um, so uh, the song, Be Not Afraid, this morning uh, comes from the scripture, which is from the book of Exodus. It talks about two women, who I'm going to leave it to the professionals to pronounce. Um, and it's an act of, like it says, it's the first recorded act of civil disobedience. So I really liked this part in that little uh, booklet that you got. Um, it says, the hands in this painting represent the women's resistance. They are the hands that said no to a power-hungry ruler, but yes to a God of justice, to a God who transforms a story of massacre into one of liberation. And that made me think how scary that must have been, right? Especially back in those times for these two women to stand up to a powerful ruler 
and how to me I was like, would I have the guts to do something like that? And so that brought up to me this song, Be Not Afraid. So please sing with us. You shall cross the barren desert, but you shall my voice. Shall we pray? Precious Lord, open our minds and hearts so that we may know the meaning of the message. Be with the minister, church leaders, and the leaders of our state and country. Help us to be better disciples for you as we leave church today. In your precious name, amen. 
There are two holidays we're celebrating today. Do you know any of the holidays we're celebrating today? Yes, Father's Day. We're celebrating Juneteenth, and we're celebrating Father's Day. And guess who this is? That's my father. I know, shocking, I have one, right? <laughs> That's my father. I want you to do me a favor. Go get your father and bring him up here, too. Well, since it's Father's Day, I thought it would be kind of fun to ask you some questions about your dad so we can, we can get to know him even better. Don't worry, they're easy. <laughs> they're good. Okay, I'm going to ask myself the same thing, too. I'll answer with you, okay? What's your dad's favorite food? Pancakes. Pancakes, good. I'm going to guess ice cream. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. OK, we're doing good. OK, your dad's favorite color. Green. Blue. Green. I'm going to say blue. Yay, we're doing good, Sammy. OK, for fun, your dad likes to do what? Go outside. Go outside. I'm going to say. Fishing or golfing? All right, we're doing good, Sammy, okay. My favorite thing to do with my dad is? Play board games. Play board games, that's awesome. My favorite thing is just to hang out and talk with my dad. And I love my daddy because? He plays with me. He plays with you, that's good. I love my daddy because he loves me no matter what. Well, I was thinking of some traits that wonderful daddies have. We are so lucky that our daddies are close to us. Some kids don't have daddies in their houses or maybe their daddies live in a different house or farther away or maybe they look up to a grandparent or an uncle as a daddy. But I was thinking some good things about dads that we have, like unconditional love. And that's a big word that means they love us when we do great, and they love us when we don't do so great. <laughs> no matter what, they love us. And I thought, you know, daddies are good about guiding us through life. I know your life is just basically starting, but your daddy is going to be good at helping you guide you through your life and a good path that, he, that you should take. And good daddies, like our daddies, are good examples of how to live, how to live our life in a good way, in a positive way. And our daddies also have taught us about Jesus and about God. And I was thinking, you know, these are wonderful traits our daddies have here on earth, but we also have a father in heaven. Our heavenly father, God, also have those wonderful traits. He loves us no matter what when we do good things or when we do not so good things. He tries to get, help us and guide us through our life. And he, on earth, Jesus showed us an example of how we should live and love others. And he wants us to always know that he is there for us and that we can talk to him at any time. Okay, will you pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you so much for fathers and fathers or men who are important in our lives, whether it be grandfathers, uncles, cousins, teachers. We thank you for them and their positive message. Help us to remember that you are our Father also and that you are always there with us, that you love us no matter what. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Happy Father's Day. Good morning. It is good to be with all of you today. And Scott, thank you for the introduction to that. It was wonderful. And be not afraid. I was raised Catholic. Be not afraid. <laughs> I told my mom that that song was going to be sung today, and she said she was going to immediately start crying. So sorry, mom. <laughs> um, so the text for today um, is going to be the familiar story of Shifra and Pua. Now, I know that I'm relatively new here, but I feel I have a pretty good read on this congregation and can tell what y'all are thinking. Uh, Another sermon about Shifra and Pua. 
All we hear is Shifra and Pua this, Shifra and Pua that. Do we ever talk about anything else, right? No, not exactly. In fact, has anybody here heard the story of Shifra and Pua before? We've got one. <laughs> Two. Um, well, true confession, I did not know of this story before writing this sermon, and I'm in pretty good company. I asked my pastor and seminary friends, they couldn't recall the story. Jacob, sorry to call you out, but was like, Shifra and Pua, I don't know who they are. <laughs> so as you will see, Shifra and Pua are just the first of many ordinary people who do extraordinary things that we will be introduced to throughout this summer sermon series. So the story is located in the opening chapter of the book of Exodus. It's probably often overlooked because it is sandwiched between two massive Old Testament narratives. You've got the story of Joseph and his amazing Technicolor dream coat, which concludes the book of Genesis, and then the story of Moses, including the Ten Commandments, which consumes Exodus and Deuteronomy. These two narratives are so significant that they were made into a Broadway production and a major motion picture. It is no wonder that Shifra and Pua get lost in the middle of this. But it is precisely this sandwiched location that makes this short narrative so important. It serves as a transition from the final prosperity of Joseph to the condition of slavery, oppression, and genocide that Moses is born into. So to set the scene, Genesis ended with the death of Joseph in Egypt. While alive, Joseph, and by extension the Israelites, had found favor with the Egyptians. But a lot of time had passed between the death of Joseph and the beginning of this new narrative in Exodus. The opening verses of Exodus explain that the Israelites had multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, making them now a threat to a new Pharaoh who had no loyalty to Joseph. All the privileges that the Israelites had received because of Joseph were erased, and the Israelites quickly went from experiencing power and fortune to slavery and oppression. So let's take a look at the text to find out what happens next. This is a reading from Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 22. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians subjected the Israelites to hard servitude and made their lives bitter with hard servitude and mortar and bricks in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, kill him, but if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? This verse is important. We're going to be concentrating on this next verse here. The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. And this is the testimony of the people of God. Well, if you were hoping to come here today and hear a sweet and uplifting Bible story, I hate to tell you, but you came on the wrong Sunday. This text is pretty brutal. The fortune of the Israelites had changed. Not only were they experiencing conditions of hard slavery and bitter oppression, but their very livelihood was under threat by a harsh ruler who was willing to go as far as genocide to subdue the Israelites and maintain his powerful state-building program. And this is where Shifra and Pua enter the scene. 
These two ordinary midwives were under direct order from Pharaoh to kill every Hebrew boy as soon as they were born, but Shifra and Pua disobey. The biblical text is clear about the reason for Shifra and Pua's courageous defiance. They feared God. This phrase is used throughout the Old Testament, often implying a level of trust and obedience. It is also related to wisdom, understood as a recognition and a rejection of evil. And we see all of this in Shifra and Pua's defiance, which began with the recognition of evil in Pharaoh's request, followed by an obedient and courageous response to God, despite the risks. Their trust in God was greater than their fear of Pharaoh. And, as Scott mentioned, this act of defiance is named as the first act of civil disobedience in the Bible. When Pharaoh confronts Shifra and Pua, their exchange is interesting and insightful, as it gives us a glimpse into one of the ways in which Pharaoh justified the slavery and oppression of the Hebrews. When Pharaoh asks why the midwives let the boys live, they lie, explaining that Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. This defense seems a little strange, but Pharaoh oddly accepts it. We can better understand his easy acceptance if we take a closer look at their response in Hebrew. The word that is translated as vigorous is chayot, which can mean lively, but it also carries a meaning of being animalistic. In fact, the root of this word is used throughout Genesis to refer to the creation of wild animals and beasts. Verse 19 becomes clearer if we bring in this tone in order to save their own lives, Shifra and Pua appeal to Pharaoh's understanding that Hebrew women are distinctly different and less than human. They say, the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are like animals, giving birth at rapid speed. Pharaoh finds this explanation to be satisfactory and spares their lives. Throughout history, Dehumanization has been used as an effective strategy to justify acts of oppression and genocide. We can most clearly see this during the Holocaust when Jews were depicted as being parasitic, described as rats, leeches, and viruses. Parasites are excluded from our system of morality and not granted the same basic human rights as the rest of us. So while it may be wrong to kill another person, it is permissible to exterminate a rat. This was Pharaoh's strategy, and it is quite likely that he himself genuinely believed that the Hebrews were qualitatively different than the Egyptians and less than human. They were like animals. Today is June 19th, also referred to as Juneteenth. It is a day that has been set aside to commemorate the emancipation of enslaved African Americans in the U.S. It is a day to celebrate the democratic achievement of emancipation. But it is also a day where we are confronted with the dark and brutal realities of our nation's past. And while it is difficult, it is important to face this history if we are to learn from it. And in similar to the way in which Pharaoh dehumanized the Hebrews to justify his oppressive scheme, enslaved African Americans were also perceived as being less than human as a way to rationalize their enslavement, even by those who are avowed Christians. As I was gathering research for the sermon, I came across the biography of two ordinary women who acted in extraordinary ways, reminiscent of Shifra and Pua. Angelina and Sarah Grimke were two sisters who were born into a wealthy slave-owning family in the early 1800s in South Carolina. Angelina and Sarah stood against all of the authoritative voices that surrounded them. Instead, courageously listening to their own Christian conscience, eventually becoming the first nationally known white female abolitionists. In their daily exposures to the realities of slavery, the Grimke sisters came to realize the ways in which the supposed inferiority of black people was used as a rationalization to maintain slavery in a Christian democratic nation. For example, Angelina wrote in her diary about a conversation that she had with her brother, someone who was regarded as a light in the church. She confronted her brother after he had severely beaten one of his young slaves. She writes, 
he very openly acknowledged that he meant to give John such a whipping as would cure him of ever doing the same thing again, and that he deserved to be whipped until he could not stand. Angelina continues, I said that would be treating him worse than he would treat his horse, to which her brother replied that there was no comparison to be made. He considered his horse to be better than John, his slave, and would never treat his horse in that way. This experience fueled Angelina with a conviction that was based on the Bible and the Declaration of Independence, writing to Southern Christian women, explaining that all humans have God-given rights. Further, despite the laws which identify slaves as property, Angelina wrote that man, who was created in the image of his maker, can never properly be termed a thing. The views of the Grimke sisters, that all human beings have rights because they are children of God, were considered radical and extreme by family members, neighbors, and even fellow church members. In fact, the Grimke sisters were expelled from several churches after confronting pastors and slave-owning elders with their interpretation of Christian equality. When account of such a proceeding explains that while the elders listened with courtesy, they told Angelina that, as young as she was, it was not strange that she should feel thus, but that riper years and wider experience surely would set her right. Some of the elders and the pastor himself said that while they sympathized with their pleas, the abolishment of slavery would create even worse evils. It was an inescapable reality and all they could do was pray and wait. They refused to speak about it to the wider congregation. In contrast to this complacency, in their appeal to white Southern Christian women, the Grimke sisters urged women to read, pray, speak, and act. To begin by educating themselves on the subject of slavery and pray for God's wisdom and guidance. Then, if they're conscientiously convinced that slavery is sinful, they must speak of their new conviction to friends and family and then act, freeing slaves or providing them fair wages and education for those who wished not to leave. And if laws forbade them from doing these things, then it was their Christian moral obligation to break these laws. The Grimke sisters, just like Shifra and Pua, refused to remain complacent in the face of inhumanity, becoming extraordinary examples of prayer and courageous action. But as we examine the courage of Shifra, Pua, and the Grimke sisters, it is also important that we consider the other perspectives in this story. When we look back at stories such as these, it is easy to automatically see ourselves on the side of good, courageously acting as Shifra, Pua, and the Grimke sisters did. We assume that we could never participate in such an evil like the rest of the Egyptians who followed Pharaoh's commands and abided in the oppression and genocide of the Hebrew people. We assume that we would act on our righteous conviction rather than remain complacent like the church elders that Angelina and Sarah confront confronted. But in assuming that we could never participate in such evil, assuming that we would have a clearer vision than those who did participate, we overlook our own very human potential to do harm in this world. The reason why the actions of Shifra and Pua and the Grimke sisters are considered to be extraordinary is because they stood out from the ordinary. This means that the dehumanization of Hebrews and African-American slaves was ordinary, normalized, and often unquestioned, concealing the reality of evil to many people. Philosopher David Livingstone Smith has written a book titled Less Than Human, why we demean, enslave, and exterminate others. In this book, in part, he writes about the dehumanization of Jews in Nazi Germany. He warns that it is tempting to imagine that the Germans were a uniquely cruel and bloodthirsty people. But, he states, these diagnoses are dangerously wrong. What's most disturbing about the Nazi phenomenon is that the Nazis were not madmen or monsters. It's that they were ordinary human beings. This can be true in how we look at slavery as well. We see it today as so clearly wrong, but we can't just assume that we would have seen so clearly in that time and place. 
Christians who sincerely believed themselves to be morally upright followers of Christ most troublingly participated in this oppression and even more commonly remained complacent in its execution. Can we be so sure that we would not have done the same? Is it possible that there are ways in which we participate in less obvious systems of oppression today to which we are blind to? What do we do with these questions? How can we be sure that we are on the right side of justice? As Christians, our starting point needs to be the recognition and affirmation of the essential humanity and the image of God in all people. We need to be alert to dehumanizing language around us in our politics, media, and conversations with friends and family. While slavery and genocide are not present realities in the US, the language still exists particularly in conversations about non-majority populations and social issues such as racism, immigration, sexuality, and gender. We must recognize that the potential of this dehumanizing language to be an instrument of violence by justifying abuse and limiting the rights of those who are considered to be nothing more than animals, objects, aliens, or deviants. We must speak up when we see or hear this happening and give voice to those who are too often silenced. But this also means that we must be attentive not only to the dehumanization of people who are marginalized, but also the dehumanization of people with whom we disagree. Any language or action that denies the humanity of another person is contrary to the will of God who created us in God's own image. Another important consideration for us Christians is to listen for the prompting of the Holy Spirit and to trust in the goodness of God. Shifra and Pua defied Pharaoh's orders because they feared God. They listened to an inner prompting and trusted in the goodness of God more than the fearing the evil of Pharaoh. Similarly, the Grimke sisters rejected the authoritative voices surrounding them, which declared enslaved people to be less than human, and they trusted in their own Christian conscience, resisting the pressures to remain complacent. Each of these women demonstrate obedience to the prompting of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. They were obedient to that pesky nudging that we experience when we are in a situation or a conversation that doesn't quite feel right. But it can be very tempting to ignore this prompting because it usually means that the Spirit is moving us to do something or say something that is difficult. We don't usually need prompting to do the things that are easy in our lives. And this brings us to a strange but important question, one that my former seminary professor and mentor used to ask. If the prompting of the Holy Spirit is similar to a gut feeling, then how do you know the difference between the Holy Spirit and indigestion? <laughs> this question stems from her concern that historically, while there's been a lot of good done in the name of God, there's also been a lot of harm. So how can we know the difference between the prompting of the Holy Spirit and the urge to act in our own self-interest or the interest of our group? Here again, we ask the question, does what I'm feeling nudged to do affirm the essential humanity of all people? Further, does it follow the example of Christ? I've also found in my own experiences when I'm feeling nudged to do something difficult, if I pray about it and then pay attention, signs of confirmation and systems of support begin to appear. While we may sometimes be nudged to stand in opposition to a majority, rarely are we, rarely are we called to stand completely alone. Sometimes, all that is needed is for one person to speak up in order for others who have felt a similar nudging to find the courage to raise their own voice. And this leads us to the final point, which is critical. Courage appears in many forms. And sometimes, the most courageous thing to do is to listen with an open mind and be willing to change course and admit when we have been wrong. This is difficult. I struggle to do this. When our convictions and worldview are called into question, we tend to resist it. But we can't always see corruption and destruction when it is right in front of our faces. So it's critical that we always carry with us an element of humility and openness to the potential that we may not always be right. The nudging of the Holy Spirit may just take the form of someone who has entered our lives to open our eyes to see things in a different light. In these situations, it can take extraordinary courage to be willing to listen with an open mind and an open heart. As Christians, we await the ultimate goal, 
what we tend to refer to as the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a time when the extraordinary becomes just plain ordinary. This is what we pray for when we say on earth as it is in heaven. But until that time, there is work to be done, and we do not do it alone. God goes before us, with Christ leading the way. God remains within us as the wisdom of the Holy Spirit nudging us to courageously do what is right. And God is all around us, providing us with strength and support to follow through on our convictions. But ultimately, it is our own decision to make. When confronted by Pharaoh and the dehumanizing evil that continues to persist in this world, will we be ordinary and complacent, or will we courageously resist and be extraordinary? Hallelujah. Amen. That was a great sermon, wasn't it? Very good. Very good. Thank you. That's good. All right. So next time that text comes up, we'll all know ahead of time who Sifra and Pua are. But we turn now to a time of prayer, a time where we remember uh, those who we hold in our thoughts and our prayers. Those names are listed in our bulletin, and we send that weekly list out as well. May this be a time for us to center ourselves and to listen for that spirit that nudges us towards wholeness for humanity. Let us pray with one another. God, we give you thanks for this morning's message, for the sermon, for the words of faith, for the reminder to listen, to pray, to speak, and to act. For the reminder that we are all created in your image, God. And because we are created in your image, we are called to love one another fully and completely. In our own lives, wherever we may be and whatever we may be experiencing, may your spirit speak to us nudge us, and may we confirm with others what we are feeling, seeing, hearing, and doing. And then when we have that confirmation, God, may you send us out into the world to be the hands and feet of Christ, to be servants of your mission. On this weekend, we remember and celebrate Father's Day We also remember and celebrate Juneteenth and the good news of the emancipation and freedom. But even as we celebrate God, we know that the work is not yet done. So call us to work for equality for all people, all races, all gender, all places, and all times. And now hear us as we say together the prayer that your son taught us to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. Oh, we forgive those who sin against us. (laughs) Not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Ha! I was thinking about this week, and I guess I thought about it. Maybe when you said you grew up Catholic, I grew up disciple. But in the Lord's Prayer, we always said, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And then um, I just got out of rhythm. Debts, debtors, trespasses, trespassers. Oh, Lord, just give us that forgiveness and grace. All right. However you say it, it's going to work. Ah, nice little self-correction during the prayer there. Mitzi, can you lead us in the call to offering? (laughs) Let's get on with this service. Seems like nowadays everybody wants money. We're bombarded by organizations wanting money. And of course, gas costs more, food costs more. Seems like everything costs more. And here we are talking about offering, giving money to the church. Just think, though, if we don't give money to the church, we cannot further the cause of God. We cannot help those in need, which is part of the things that we're supposed to do as a Christian. So let's think about giving our offering. It doesn't have to be a huge amount. It can be a smaller amount. But you want to give it because you want to give it, 
You want to be cheerful giver, as they say in the Bible. Uh, I know when I started giving a little bit more money than I usually did, I was afraid that I might not have enough money to live. But so far, I'm not homeless. I'm paying my bills, and so it does work. God does provide for those who are trying to help further his cause. So let's pray that we can do this. Now, shall we pray? Dear God, help us to use the offering in the best way to make a difference in the world. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Thank you, Mitzi. And now as we come to a time of communion, where of course all are welcome to experience and share with one another, let us sing our song of communion, How Firm a Foundation. Uh, before we do that real quick, I thought of something that I, I wanted to tell you, and I know I'm going to cry um, when I say it. But um, I started practice for my new show, and <laughs> I made a new friend. And this week, we were just talking after practice. And he told me that he was kicked out of his church for being gay, and he was ostracized by his family. And side note, his dad is the pastor of the church that kicked him out. And when I told him that our church goes to pride, he started crying. And I just wanted to kind of thank the church and also be sure that you know that the little stuff that we do when we go down to pride, it may seem little to us, but to people like him, who on a Father's Day like today doesn't have a dad because he's gay, it means a lot to people like that. This is why I'm not supposed to talk, because I cry all the time. <laughs> all right, we're going to sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5 of How Firm a Foundation. Oh 
is indeed our foundation. And just to uh, echo what Scott said, how important it is that all are welcome to the table and to God's church. Next weekend is St. Louis Pride Fest, and we do have signups, a few spots still available if you'd like to join us at the booth for local disciple churches. Mitzi, will you please lead us in prayer? Precious Lord, when Jesus ate his last meal with his disciples, he knew he was going to die a cruel death on the cross to save us from our sins. When you come to the table today, examine your heart and know the great debt he paid for you. Now bless the bread and the cup in your precious name. Amen. And now we recall that on the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took a loaf of bread. After giving thanks, he blessed it and he broke it. And he shared it with his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us share the bread. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he arrives. Let us drink the cup of salvation. Amen. And now... I invite you to stand as we sing the song that sends us forth, I Walk by Faith. So this is another one that came to me when I heard the story of, which I now know how to say, Shifra and Pua, lifelong learners, that's what's important. Um, but Shifra and Pua walked by faith, so as we go out into the world, may we also walk by faith. Please join us. benediction, I just want to say quickly um, how much of a privilege I consider it to have the opportunity to speak today. So thank you so much. I 
I've been wandering for about 10 months around West County looking for a church and um, stumbled across this wonderful church and knew right away that it was special because of the people, because of all of you. Um, so I'm just, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for your warm welcome um, and, and thank you for the privilege of being able to speak today. So please receive this benediction. As you go out into this world and into this week, go with courage, knowing that you do not go alone, but that God goes before you, is behind you, is all around you and in you. And in Christ's name we say, amen.